please know that today's episode may use some offensive language, but this is not to offend anyone, but to explore the roots of certain terms we're gonna be discussing today. What comes to mind when you hear the word redneck? Chances are it's a white Southerner, someone that hangs an American or Confederate flag outside their home, someone who drives a pickup truck, and maybe they drink a little too much beer. The term isn't often really used as a compliment. You know, look man, the other guy's base is what I grew up in. You know, I'm basically your standard redneck. How's it? Like, what did you just say? I said, I got me a date tonight with a country girl. I just got done chewing my toenails, chewing my fingernails. I spit my dip out. I'm going to go in there and take a shower, fix my hair, and start me a bonfire. And let's be real for a minute, it's become synonymous with white trash. And right about now, given the political divide in this country, rednecks are often seen as Republican, American lovers, Trump supporters, at least in the modern day. But that wasn't always the case. In fact, years ago, the term redneck meant the opposite of what people associate it with today. See, history is often written by the winners and the wealthy. But back in the 1800s and early 1900s, the term redneck was used to oppress miners to paint them as communists and dangerous when they were simply trying to unionize and fight for their rights to a good wage and a job that wasn't as deadly. The author of Rednecks and Red Bandanas, Patrick Huber explains, quote, during the last four decades of the 20th century, redneck also referred to a miner who was a member of a labor union, particularly one who was on strike. This last now obsolete meaning provides insight into how the United Mine Workers used language and symbols to foster union solidarity among racially and ethnically divided miners. I never thought the term redneck would stand for truly admirable workers fighting for human rights, but the world has changed and evolved so much over the years that I found it worth looking into. So on today's episode of Dark Dives, I wanna go all the way back to the origin of the term to see what redneck first meant, how it was used by miners, and find out how it turned into what it is today. Let's get into it. Although the origin of the term has been debated, one of the very first times it appears in a published work was in 1830 in a travelogue where it referenced the Presbyterians of Fayetteville, North Carolina. Then it appeared in 1837 and in 1860, each time talking about a lower class Southern white person. However, while this might sound like the way redneck is used today, it soon became something else. In 1885, it was used with anti-immigrant sentiments to address Southern Americans that were, quote, imported from the slums of England and Europe. Basically, as more and more people, even poorer people immigrated to the US from Europe, the wealthy and semi-established families in the US did what they do best and they acted xenophobic. Redneck was a slur used by the upper class to describe the lower class. And this is where the idea of redneck coming from a sunburned neck for those who worked outside comes from. I do find it really interesting how the term was once anti-immigration, honestly. Today, rednecks are often defined by how much they wanna keep things traditional and their anti-immigration or even downright racist values. But in the late 1800s, the poor white Southerner was the immigrant and they were the ones looked down on. However, as we've seen before, people in the South started owning that term and transforming its meaning into something, well, a little bit more meaningful. Coal miners, for example, were treated especially badly during this time and well into the early 1900s. You wanna call them rednecks? Go for it. They took it literally and started wearing red bandanas on their necks to identify themselves as one another. They were pro-union, viewed as communists by outsiders, but viewed as determined men fighting for workers' rights on the inside. After all, when I say coal mines were oppressive at that time, I don't just mean the hours were a bit long. We're talking a ridiculous amount of control that these companies had over their workers' lives. Not only did they typically own the houses the miners lived in, but they also ran the supply store, controlled the cost of living, and restricted basic freedom of speech. Many of these coal fields were also right by sundown towns, and when African-American miners visited them, they risked being lynched. It was slavery by another name, basically, which is why the red bandana and the red neck was such an important identifier. 
I'm not about to sit here and say that all white and black miners got along and ignored the color of each other's skin because that is simply not true. But redneck was a way for them to show solidarity towards a cause that would benefit all miners. It was a movement or a symbol, and it was a way of taking back a word that was used to oppress them. And it was about to become all the more important when the mine wars began. The outbreaks and violence between workers and employers that followed were known as the Mine Wars. Those began in 1890, but some of the very worst ones that I could find took place in the 1900s. The Department of Labor lists the Pennsylvania coal strikes of 1902 as a turning point in history, as the riots nearly developed into an outright social war. While I'm not about to say that this was the first time in US history that workers gained some respect, it was definitely a revelation for the White House that if they allow the so-called little guys, the miners, to be treated like trash, then they were going to be in for a nasty wake-up call. But things didn't stop there, as more and more miners took charge. Like in 1912, when miners in West Virginia wanted higher pay. According to Yale's page on energy history, coal operators called in a union-busting agency called the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency, and when they attempted to break the strike, violence erupted. The episode truly marked the beginning of the mine wars, the time when workers began pleading for reform. Some of those who represented miners had worked in them since they were just children. Fred Mooney and Frank Keeney had been miners since they were nine and 13 respectively. They knew the disturbing conditions well and the astronomical death rates that came with it. Yet even for the miners who wanted change, they were skeptical. The state and the government had a tight grip on this industry. But this didn't stop everyone. Labor organizer Mother Jones for the United Mine Workers of America wasn't to be deterred, even by those who said it was a lost cause. Private guards waved guns in her face and still Mary Harris Mother Jones stuck by her motto, I have no home except where there is struggle. And just by the way, she was 65 years old when she was trying to convince these miners to unionize, trying to get their spirits up and telling them to fight back. Miners were inspired to fight back as a direct result of her efforts and her rallying cries. Language like, these towns are ours and this mine is ours really resonated with people. In the start, miners took pride in being beaten down and doing some of the hardest, most thankless jobs in the country. They didn't care if the public understood, there was a solidarity and a brotherhood in it. Posters like this one that read, Uncle Sam needs that extra shovel full, circled around all during World War I, and it also emphasized the idea of doing good for the country, even at your own expense. But it took people like Mother Jones coming along and saying, why are you allowing yourself to be treated this way? That truly helped miners snap out of it and rise up. She and other labor organizers like her sparked a revolution. Things eventually became so intense that after five months of striking in 1912, 6,000 union miners threatened to kill company guards and destroy company equipment. On the surface, you might be disgusted to hear that and think that strikers had gone too far, but I'm not sure they had any other choice either. You see, the miners were dying under the appalling work conditions that were available to them at the time. And then when they went on strike, mine guards would conduct drive-by assaults and force men, women, and children out of their homes. As extreme as it sounds, the threats definitely brought attention to the matter, and the state militia came in and seized a ton of ammunition and weapons from both parties. More than anything, it seems, these miners wanted to be treated with respect, but the outsiders saw them as, well, rednecks. Wilma Steele, a founding member of the West Virginia Mine Wars Museum, told Smithsonian, quote, "'Locals had a reputation for being violent and unreasonable. It set the stereotype that they were used for feuding and they were people who don't care about anything but a gun and a bottle of liquor,' says Steele. That was the propaganda, but these people were being abused." And I know maybe it sounds like I'm just a little bit off topic here, but let me circle back. It's important to understand how beaten down these men were. There have been slurs used throughout history, like the N word, the R word, or the F word. And those have been said with so much hatred that someone outside of those communities simply should not use them. Those communities have tried to take those words back and give them a new sense of meaning, even if they still cause harm. I'm not about to say that redneck is the exact same way, at least in the modern day, it's certainly not nearly as insulting as other slurs out there. But back in the early 1900s, beaten down and abused lower class Southerners were being inspired to stand up for themselves. And a part of that was taking language back that was once used to hurt. And they had only just begun. Police Chief Sid Hatfield of Maytown, West Virginia had defended local miners during the mine wars. 
In August 1921, he was gunned down by armed detectives hired by coal operators. But at that time, people said he was yet another death resulting from infamous Hatfield and McCoy feud, despite it having been quiet for well over 20 years. In actuality, Hatfield was a quote, caring policeman who walked drunk coal miners in the area home instead of arresting them. But Hatfield was effectively branded as a redneck, a wild hillbilly, a no good Southerner lowlife, or whatever you wanna call it. The miners who had already been on the verge of a boiling point for years, finally could not contain their anger anymore. Hatfield's murder and probably the way he was talked about after his death sparked the legendary Battle of Blair Mountain. And no, it's not my mountain. I wasn't involved in any way, I swear. But the Battle of Blair Mountain, no relation, had begun. This is where Patrick Huber's analysis is important as the term redneck now referred to the red bandanas worn by the strikers and calling them reds could also mean communist. And it was also used to denigrate the miners in the coal fields. Think of like the red scare, right? You certainly wouldn't wanna be called a red back then. And even though this was a different time and a different era, it still wasn't exactly favorable to be aligned with the communist party. In my opinion, this was a way for the government and the higher ups of the coal mine to other their workers. And this happens in politics all the time, even if we don't immediately see it. We dismiss people as snowflakes, liberal hippies, Trump lovers, or yes, rednecks when we don't agree with their ideologies. Sometimes perhaps it is warranted because let's be real, there's just no room for logic for some people when it comes to politics. Like if you still think that in this very moment, Trump is the president, then yes, I'm going to categorize you as delusional and I'm really not going to bother interacting with you. Because let's just face it, he's not president right now. It's not an opinion, it is a fact, but I digress. Now, when it comes to these protests that were known as the redneck revolution, those controlling the narrative would call miners Bolsheviks or reds without actually knowing for sure if they even held any communist sentiments. So I think you could understand how it's not hard to see why when the goal was to demoralize or for lack of a better word, undermine these miners, it was also a way for the public to take their messages less seriously. After all, hearing about a red communist sympathizer being shot doesn't sound as tragic as a 19 year old miner being subjective to abusive working conditions. The stereotypes didn't stop there either, but started to dip into eugenics territory too. Elizabeth Catt, author of What You're Getting Wrong About Appalachia says, quote, Charles Davenport, the director of the eugenics record office once said Virginia's mountains were full of mongrels and called hill folk a badly put together people. In her book, Catt notes that individuals were sterilized if they were deemed unfit. Catt adds in interviews that many Appalachians are reclaiming the term to this day, a term that was once used to justify the literal eugenics attitude against them. I really don't care what you think of a particular community. If you think they're unintelligent or loud or dirty or whatever, eugenics is not the answer. Disagreeing with a belief system or mindset is one thing, but someone's genes or saying someone's bloodline shouldn't exist is another. But at least to some extent, and as the years wore on, workers did make the term their own. One union song from 1927, which I'm not going to sing, but I will read the lyrics, goes a little something like this. Rednecks, keep them scabs away. Rednecks fight them every day. Now any old time you see a scab passing by, now don't hesitate, blacken both of his eyes. But even if this was what redneck meant for quite some time, it once again evolved. The miners of the South and Appalachian areas had pride in who they were, hardworking, determined, able to weather any storm, you name it. And once the stereotypical Southern image evolved, so did the typical Southern redneck. That's why in the 70s, redneck became about fashion. A bit odd, but right? Redneck chic was in, and it was about Americana more than anything. Once again, expert Patrick Huber weighed in on the topic, quote, Suddenly, trendy white Americans across the country affected phony Southern drawls, dressed up in Levi's and cowboy boots, sipped Lone Star and Paps long necks, tuned into Waylon and Willie, and hankered for meals of fried pork chops, grits, greens, and biscuits and gravy. Redneck chic was a trend. The hit film Urban Cowboy gave this trend momentum and two rednecks started to separate from one another. Yeah, sure, redneck still meant an uneducated person living in the middle of nowhere to some, but it also meant someone who now has a mowed yard, a garden, designer jeans, cowboy boots, and a truck. I walk and talk like a field hand, but the boots I'm wearing cost three grand. 
I write songs about riding tractors from the comfort of a private jet. Obviously different era, but same energy. And from what I've read and what I can gather, it seems like this happened in tandem with the hippie movement as a sort of counterculture moment. On one hand, you had this free love, nomadic, wandering kind of lifestyle. While here with Redneck Chic, it made a trend of the opposite, traditional homegrown, wear your Sunday best kind of values. There was a little something for everyone. According to the University of California Press, Willie Nelson and Waylon Jennings also attracted listeners that identified with the counterculture and music became one of the defining pieces of the movement. Unfortunately, racial diversity wasn't. Quote, Despite the potential to target increasing numbers of non-white fans, the industry remained more committed than ever before to defining the music as a product for an affluent, white, and predominantly conservative audience only. Redneck Chic could have expanded past its little bubble and gone on to share their music and cornbread with others, but the music really didn't include others. I have to wonder if in the 80s, the counterculture decided to start championing diversity, like what would this country music look like today? Would redneck always mean a white person as it means now? We'll never know, but it is an interesting thinking point. Country music and redneck chic apparently went very much hand in hand, and it was country music that contributed to the next evolution of the word. With Garth Brooks and Sawyer Brown and obviously Tim McGraw came along these rednecks and private jets that Bo Burnham sung about earlier. The thing about flying it, that for me, that, that it's just the relaxation of it. I mean, not. Damn, I hope no one dies on this night shift tonight. And of course that leads us to the very small tangent of Jason Aldean and the whole try this in a small town moment. I'm sure you guys remember that from a couple months ago, there was a lot of an uproar of, you know, him making the song of try that in a small town and people were analyzing the music video and like the, the newspaper clippings he were using had a lot of racial undertones. He's like, no, 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 this is not a racist song or anything. This is just about a small town. And he grew up in Macon, Georgia. It's not to say that you can't enjoy country music if you live in the city. There's plenty of people who do, but the redneck values and classic hillbilly terms really don't exist much in urban areas. Now these terms are just far more jumbled and at the turn of the millennia could apply to a whole host of people, whether they're upper or lower class, whether they're working folks or not. Some articles identify this as a postmodern redneck. No matter how you feel about these terms or if you see redneck as a completely different thing from hillbilly, the once Southern stereotypes have evolved very, very far since the early days of the 1800s. However, when used in a negative demeaning way, they still have serious consequences. And I can't possibly talk about the term redneck without addressing that. This holiday season, if you wanna hear, where'd you get that? Uncommon Goods is your secret weapon. Uncommon Goods is here to make your holiday shopping stress-free by scouring the globe for the most remarkable and truly unique gifts for everyone on your list. Whether you're shopping for your secret Santa or your whole family, Uncommon Goods knows exactly what they want. Here's a few of my favorite gifts that I found on their site. So one of the things that I actually bought is called the Book Nook Reading Valet, and I absolutely love it because I don't know why I've been really, really getting back into reading in the past couple months. And it's essentially this little wooden triangle so that you can like save your place where you are on your book, like exactly where it is. And then it also has like a little cup holder next to it. So you can have like your favorite mug with you or a cold drink or whatever. I really, really love it. And it's extremely sturdy and clearly well-built. But there's also really cool DIY kits too, like a whiskey making kit. There's like a book making kit. There's like a 24 days of tea advent calendar, a popcorn bowl that comes with a kernel sifter. There is so many cool things that you can gift this holiday season. And when you shop at Uncommon Goods, you're supporting artists and small independent businesses. These products are often made in small batches. So shop now before they sell out this holiday season. And to get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash dark dives. That's uncommongoods.com slash dark dives for 15% off. Don't miss out on this very special limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. When people in rural communities don't have access to the best of healthcare, and many have been targeted by pharma executives who know their products are harmful and addictive. I doubt you'd be surprised to learn that executives have done this in Appalachian communities and in West Virginia. But the infuriating part is that they mocked the people they hurt, calling them pillbillies. Emails between pharmaceutical firms have shown rhymes about a quote, poor mountaineer named Jed who barely kept his habit fed. 
In this rhyme, Jed would fly to Florida to buy hillbilly heroin, aka Oxycontin. Other rhymes called Kentucky Oxycontinville. Even before these suits, the term hillbilly heroin has long existed and been standard nomenclature for describing the Oxycontin epidemic in the South. No, the term redneck isn't used here, but I'm still getting the same vibes and energy and it felt worth addressing. Hearing the pharmaceutical industry use it sure as hell implies that they think, oh, hey, these hillbillies are so stupid that they can get addicted to anything. Pump them full of hillbilly heroin, so to speak. And I think it's gross because you don't need a college degree or to be upper class to be treated as a person. I could go on and on about the people living in Appalachia, how they have their own traditions, cultures, talents, and self-sustaining practices. But the simple fact of the matter is that they're human, and that means that they deserve to be treated as such. But just as the term can do real harm, it's also being reclaimed. However, whereas miners used it to stand proud against workplace abuse, Lately, others are using it to stand proud for things that, in my opinion, they really shouldn't be proud of. As NPR explained back in 2016, there was a resurgence of redneck pride going around, only it wasn't sparked by equality labor movements. No, no, not at all. Instead, race, class, and Trump had everything to do with it. Now, I'm obviously not quite sure which one actually came first. People calling Trump supporters rednecks as an insult or white Southerners calling themselves redneck as a synonym to Trump supporters. They both seem to kind of happen in tandem and not just among the public, but even in articles and people that are supposed to be, well, professionals, quote. A columnist in the New York Daily News calls Trump supporters bigots, bumpkins, and rednecks. And as we saw in the intro, Bill Clinton used the term rednecks at this time too. While I didn't see the terms white trash or hillbillies floating around in articles or by politicians as much as the term redneck, they're pretty much synonymous with each other by this point. Hell, one historian back in 1989 said redneck is the only epithet for an ethnic minority that's still permitted in polite company. And I don't know if he's exactly right or wrong here, but I also don't think it's difficult to see why the term is used. Now, this is my only opinion on that, so feel free to disregard it, but there's one thing about the word redneck that, to me at least, makes it different from any of the other epithets out there that are just downright slurs. You know, the N-word, the F-word, the R-word. None of those discuss someone's character, their morals, or their class. The N-word is about race, the F-word is about sexuality, and the R-word is about disabilities. None of those three things can be changed or erased, and to call someone a slur because of that is reprehensible. And with the term redneck, it seems like it's just a bit different. I'm not saying you should judge someone based on them being white and living in the South. Don't judge a book by its cover. But at the same time, redneck has also, oddly enough, become a lifestyle for many. NPR said that Donald Trump Jr. called himself a closet redneck because of his love of fly fishing and bow hunting. And if I hear someone use the term redneck, I'm thinking of someone that cares more about their truck and their beer than equality and women's rights. Those things can be helped. Those things can be changed. So if someone is called a redneck and it means you're an ignorant, biased, Trump-supporting racist, then that's far more preferable than insults or slurs used simply based on a skin color. I'm not sure if that fully makes sense. I hope I'm making sense. I'm not trying to use this as permission to go around and use offensive language, but to simply explain the different connotations it has and why for some it may be more acceptable than other terms. Again, obviously words have different meanings for different people, but it's pretty largely accepted and seen as a fact that the term's original definition was the exact opposite of what it is now. From a resistance fighter to culturally ignorant, the values behind redneck have altered significantly. I mean, if you look at these early, early country songs, and I'm talking before the 70s, Okay, this is something where it's, if your husband's abusing you, shoot that motherfucker. If the police are fucking with you in town, kill that motherfucker and change the laws, change the way the town's being run, all that kind of stuff. And you move on with your life, you make things better. And now it's yummy, yummy, boot tastes so good, I can't shove this thing down my throat deep enough. And I'm like, I don't know, that's pretty fucking opposite to me. Maybe you'll disagree with me here, but I honestly don't think that Trump supporters deserve the word redneck, which has been uh, used to brand men and women that are fighting for unions and worker equality. Hell, I don't think I'll probably really use the word again when discussing racists because they don't deserve to reclaim a word that once supported unionizing minors everywhere against their oppressors. As one New York Times author from Tennessee wrote, quote, Today, redneck culture has become less about building solidarity among working folks and more about supporting white nationalism. Urban Americans often think of rednecks as backward and make jokes about us being uneducated and inbred. 
The truth is, Republican voters who fight against expanding human rights are simply not rednecks, although they might think of themselves that way. Republican supporters bastardize hillbilly history. You can't claim to be from Hicktown if you don't fight for the Hicks in it. So cheers out there to the real rednecks, the ones that fought for workers' rights and the ones who continue to fight for workers' rights. And as for the modern ones that don't believe in equality, you're not a redneck, you're just a racist. But with all of that being said, that is where we're gonna end today's episode of Dark Dives. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date with all the latest episodes. I really appreciate you spending some of your time here with me today, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.